first priority is um, are you eating enough protein? Is your um, are you eating enough like meals? Are you eat, like are you eating yeah, real food? Are you, are you eating enough for your sport? Um, so. But also, is your gut functioning? Like, mm-hmm. are your hormones completely out of whack? If those things are not in place, if you're not sleeping and you're like those things are more important than like have I got the perfect macronutrients and meal timing? So. You ready? Let's go! I don't think I've ever heard myself described <laughs> so grandly. Um, it's, it's, you know, I've, I've wanted to get Jess in the show for the longest time, and I remember when she was leaving uh, to go back, and I was like, oh, we got to figure something out, we got to figure something out, we got to figure something out. We were just starting off, so, and you were like, so good, anyways. Uh, yeah. Anyways, um, let's get started. So, First things first, so Jess uh, just completed uh, a competition in uh, the end of March. Yes. The end of March. Mm-hmm. And her world is now well over 400. Just over 400. Just over 400. Uh, <laughs> she joined the whole 400 group. And uh, I just want to ask you, how was that experience? This was the best meet I've ever had. It was so... Um, Like every meet you're gonna have uh, things you learn from, um, but all of the learning experiences in the past um, came together. So I went nine for nine, uh, PR'd my squat, bench, and total. And obviously got the Wilkes that I'd been working for for a while. So um, my prep leading up went really well, Uh, I've been, loving the way the work I've been doing with my coach uh, Bryce Lewis and then just meet day like everything fell into place nutrition and all of that stuff so um, I had a great coach on the day um, Liz Craven who if you know powerlifting you know she's amazing so um, you know it was lots of good things happened that day so um, for me I can only hope to have more comp days like it. <laughs> well, what, is, what were your... I think this is more... We'll get into the advice for the young ones right now. But what was your mindset like the night before? Um, this was one of the first mates where I literally just fell asleep. <laughs> um, over the years, I've been able to... I've gotten better. I think competition, CrossFit competition started preparing me for, um, for that, the stress of competition. Um, that was obviously before I changed to powerlifting. Um, there, being able to like sleep and turn your mind off and be able to go into the comp relaxed is like a huge thing. Um, and yeah, I like crashed, had an amazing night's sleep and, um, 
I weighed in the lightest I've ever competed and um, it just everything was good where I've, I've had other meets where I like couldn't sleep I was like thinking about it constantly the whole night and like that obviously affects your ability to lift the next day so what was what was so what would be the what would be the uh, top tip for like the young ones who that we just come off a of powerlifting competition mm -hmm. and I remember uh, I remember getting quite a few messages with like hey what are we supposed to do what are we supposed to think what are we supposed to? and I was like just watch powerlifting videos <laughs> just watch powerlifting videos all you well, know. well to me. Um, comp day you've done all the hard work already yeah. so you have to think that like you've done weeks maybe months of prep you've done those lifts over and over and over again it's probably only your third attempts that you haven't lifted before so what are you stressing about like you've made those lifts if you're smart and your coach is smart your first attempts should be super easy weights um, if again if you're smart and your coach is smart you haven't done a huge weight cut um, if you're new to lifting you shouldn't be cutting weight um, so really like what are you stressing about you're not like I can understand the stress when you're at a national level and there's things on the line um, and again that's all mental state as well but um, when you're starting out it's like you're just trying to do the best you can do on that day so we put all this pressure on ourselves. It's like, even if you bomb all your lifts, you're gonna learn something from it. Yeah. So there's more to gain from that than... So just keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, and you gotta have fun with it. Like, if you're not having fun, there's no point doing it. Correct. Yeah. Great advice. Um, Jess, let's start with, how would you, so you are coming from a flight attendant background. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was just telling her life is not fair. Um, <laughs> progress, but um, to see the amount of hard work she puts in every single day, it doesn't matter. I mean, from where, when I knew Jess, before she left, she had a full time job. Mm -hmm. And then she would come here and coach for at least four to five hours. Mm -hmm. And then train herself. Mm -hmm. um, the woman is the, like, the prime example of hard working. Okay. Um, how did that happen? How did the transition happen? Um, how did Dubai happen? Yeah, so Dubai happened because I wanted to travel and see the world and I heard about Emirates and thought it sounded like fun. I didn't know where it was on the map and um, from the interview to getting the job and being in Dubai was four weeks and I went, oh, okay, let's go and have fun. I was 22 and I was young and immature and excited and all of those things um, I flew commercial and then private um, for seven and a half years uh, for the first five years I partied a lot drank a lot um, ate a lot and didn't do much else <laughs> and then I put my back yeah then I put my back out on a flight um, and the, the osteopath said, um, you need to get fit or it's going to keep happening. Because uh, some of the best advice a doctor will ever give you, you don't often hear that advice. <laughs> yeah. So I started doing like group exercise classes and then eventually circuit classes and then signed up for a Tough Mudder. And when I did that I was like I need to up my training ante and um, some friends had told me about CrossFit so I started CrossFit um, I'm a little bit competitive a little. <laughs> so um, that first year like walking into a CrossFit gym and seeing people stronger than me that could do stuff I couldn't do like I wanted to do that I didn't I wanted to be not the weak person in the gym um, I wanted to do all those skills, I wanted to lift those weights. Um, I accidentally made uh, a regionals team that year. You accidentally made a regionals team? Well, I just happened to be, there was not a lot of competition in back in those days. Uh, CrossFit has evolved a lot. Um, 
but I went to regionals and I remember seeing the top girls in the region then and going holy shit I want to do that like god I'm so crap I'm so weak and um, that fueled my training for the next three years because I wanted to go and be at regionals and deserve to be there um, I made regionals again on a team in 2016 and then I was like well I've done that I'm 32 I have a full-time job I only have so many hours in the day and the reality was that I don't have enough hours in the day and I'm not quite young enough to be as competitive as I want to be in CrossFit but I'm pretty strong so I looked at the numbers for like what the top people in powerlifting were doing and was like well that's not far off what I'm lifting anyway um, so and then the week I'd had a conversation with a friend about like making the change and finding a powerlifting coach after regionals I met Patrick so Patrick is a, a friend of ours and Swedish national team lifter great athlete and coach um, so we did it. We changed over and it's, you know, the rest is history, so. Phenomenal. Any problems at all on the space So close to the next one. But, great. Great story. Okay, uh, where... We'll start with the seconds and uh, we'll go into the meat and potatoes now. So, let's uh, talk training. Mm -hmm. So, Jess, uh, what are your numbers right now? I a 150 squat, a 90 bench, and a 170 deadlift, comp lifts. Okay. What is your what is your training schedule like on and off season? So let's let's start with off season. Um, are you, are you your off season? So I'm off season now. Um, I train six days a week. Yep. Um, the seventh day I have off because it's smart. Um, not because I necessarily feel like I have to. <laughs> um, I try to get out of the gym and just do something. I normally am still doing something active, but um, just change of scenery and do something fun. Um, tomorrow I'm doing pole dancing apparently. Um, so it's just you've got to keep things interesting um, but in off season I'm focusing more on uh, hypertrophy and building structure so I do more uh, strongman inspired stuff um, I pull back on the amount of um, the powerlifting lifts I do I still do them each week but I don't do I don't squat every day and I don't bench three times a week um, but I do more variations of pressing I do um, like more obviously bodybuilding all of that stuff um, l much more of like loaded carries and sled work and things like that um, because uh, I see a lot of powerlifters all year round all they do is powerlifting and then at some point they're like oh I can't understand why my hips hurt or my backs or yeah. something um, and the th essentially you're not building the structure to support the amount of weight that you then are moving and so you're getting stronger but the supporting structure isn't st strong enough to manage that so um, I'd rather um, take a little bit slower more conservative approach but know that in 10 years time I'll still be lifting so just vary everything on like yeah stuff. and also like having come from CrossFit I'm like my coach and other friends think I'm a little crazy but I like to keep all the skills that I have as well I'd like the idea that maybe one day in in the future I could jump into a master's CrossFit competition and still do well um, so it's important to me that I can still do handstand push-ups and muscle-ups and you know some of those silly things <laughs> what about on season so how many how many weeks so this last comp I did 18 weeks um, four days a week is powerlifting program uh, three days squatting two days deadlifting three days benching uh, yeah um, and then 
I still train six days a week, but two of the two days are um, conditioning. So one is like more of a you could call it active recovery. It's all sled stuff and sandbags and things like that. Um, and then the second day uh, is um, like gymnastics volume stuff. So it's kind of a CrossFit style workout where I'll do high rep pull-ups and push-ups and squats and running and things like that. This is on season. Yeah. Um, I found when I first made the switch to powerlifting and I stopped doing the conditioning, um, I really struggled. Um, my numbers didn't increase as much as I would have hoped and then I was just not as conditioned and I struggled through training more. So keeping up the um, keeping the conditioning up and keeping up um, my pers- my level of conditioning helped me a lot. So, so a very, I think this is very common with the new age lifters, <coughs> where a lot of them are incorporating a lot more conditioning and other varying movements and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, compared to the older uh, generation ones, where it's really just squat bench and squat bench. Right? Yeah, um, and I think it depends on the person. For me, it's a little bit of like. I, it keeps me entertained as well, yeah. but um, I do think there's a lot of value in it um, for well for everyone, but also um, you know for just general health. Like, you, yeah. what's good about being a fat powerlifter? Yeah. Like when you, you can can't run, run yeah. yeah. So you know, like oh, you've got the best like like deadlift in the world, but like you're gonna have a like die of a heart attack because you're like yeah. What happens when the lion is chasing? Yeah. So, no, I like to look at things in a much yeah. holistic view, right. so. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's get back to our Q&A after mm-hmm. some mic issues. Um, let's hit the warm-up. So I know that you are a big, big, big advocate of a, of a good warm-up. Um, you have something called deadly hollows, right? <laughs> what are they called? Deadly hollows. No, they're oblique openers. Um, <laughs> okay, oblique that, so, if you, I, I've obviously been doing uh, working with the StrongFit guys for a few years. Um, Julian Pinot of StrongFit is a movement specialist that I went to a while back to um, start fixing some imbalances. Where is he based? Uh, he all over the world. The, like about a year and a half into a world tour. Um, so, they were here, no, recently. Yeah. So, um, I if you go onto his YouTube, there are oblique opener and other opener videos. But the oblique opener, essentially, like it's uh, um, turning on um, and building the external obliques and low abs. Um, I love it because those cannot be strong enough, and essentially, it's the core of bracing for a squat and a deadlift. Correct. So um, I do those every session um, in some variation, um, essentially until I start to cramp, and then I know I'm good to go. Those muscles will know well, that they have to do now. something. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I'm a big fan of doing like uh, movement flows before I walk, before I train. So um, I like like animal crawling and you know that sort of stuff. Um, how do you think? How do you? How do you? Um, is that even when you're powerlifting? Like yeah. Before, yeah. How do you think that helps? Um, for me, it's just like I just start to get warm, <laughs> just, yeah. and it's moving through all the ranges of movement, movement in the joints. Um, I think sometimes we get too like focused on I just am warming up to squat, like. Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but I think you need to have, um, like, prepare your body to be moving, even yeah. in, yeah. So, I, that's always just, that's worked for me over the years. I've found I've tried different things, and I literally do those, and then I very quickly get into my main lifts. I don't, I am not a proponent of foam rolling. Um, I try to get in and start lifting pretty quickly, so... Um, I think if you're not ready, to, if you're not, if your body isn't in a position where you can lift quite quickly, um, then you've probably got some issues that you need to look at rather than Fair. like 
45 minute warm ups are ridiculous and it's a sign that there's stuff that you need to fix. Yeah. What is, um, what would be your ideal, like, how much time would you say you spend on your warm up? Maybe 15 minutes. 15 minutes max. Yeah. Pretty much. Good. And that's probably when I'm like giving it extra attention. <laughs> good. Yeah. It's good to know. I mean, I, I do, I do, I find so many people spending so much time on their warm ups. Foam rolling for half an hour, stretching, over mobilizing. Like it's like, come on! I mean, you're a power lifter. You have to keep the tension yeah. in your in your in your body, and you have to keep the joints nice and like uh, locked. Anyways, yeah. so I that's good to know. I would say though, um, if you're in a really cold climate, you may probably have to spend a little more time Fairly, actually yeah. getting warm because um, obviously here in Dubai, like you're hot <laughs> all the time, so. <laughs> There's only so much warming up you have to do, but like if I was in somewhere where it was snowing, I might want to like, you just literally yeah. don't want to be freezing. Probably at so. least like half an hour. Yeah. yeah. Well, it might only it'd be a few extra minutes, but it's like... A couple of shots of rum yeah. too. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Alex, we got to edit that out, okay? I'm saying rum on the podcast. Um, okay. Conditioning work, we have already touched upon it a bit, but what would you say the top three conditioning exercises you would like power lifters? Let's say power mm -hmm. lifters, and then let's talk strong men. CrossFit already are doing enough conditioning. Yeah. And um, bodybuilding, so let's do all, power lifters. All men. power lifters should do more sled work. Yeah. Um, more sled work and carries. Okay. Um, loaded carries. Strong men already do them, um, but strong men should be doing like more body weight stuff. stuff. Pull ups, push ups. Yeah. Burpees. They should be able to move their body. Yeah. Um, and they're like, right. Um, power lifters as well, but like I talk to a lot of power lifters and I say, like, when was the last time you did sled or conditioning? And they can't tell me. Yeah. Um, what I love about the sled is that. Um, it's kind of bringing up a lot, like, yeah. it's terrible. It's the ultimate leveler. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely terrible. But um, it will fix a lot of it's like structural imbalances. Mm -hmm. um, it's incredibly low skill. You can absolutely thrash yourself on the sled and be completely fine the next day. Yeah. So it won't affect the rest of your training. Um, but like if you've got hamstrings that aren't working properly and glutes, like it's going to bring those up if you're pushing it. You can do like reverse drags and have work on your quads you can do all kinds of pushes and things for your upper body like there's loads of things you can do with the sled yeah. and it's um yeah amazing. low skill and fairly safe yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so okay so sled work what else would you say body so body weight work for strong men mm -hmm. sled work for power lifters um a little bit bodybuilders bodybuilders well bodybuilders really like it's amazing how many Very bodybuilders low, low. can't like yeah. run sprint yeah, yeah. it's like tell them to go and run 5k's it's the same with well most power lifters mm -hmm. and strong men like i like to think that if you tell me to go and run a 10k race i can run it if i have sure. to run away from a bear i can like <laughs> i like i'm joking like if it's going to be the end of the world. I don't want to be the one being caught. Like I want to pass the zombies, all the other the people. Exactly. Be you, yeah. Like yeah. I definitely want other people to be like dying before me. So okay. that's a good point. People train for that. <laughs> so strong men, more stri more, uh, more sled work. Sorry, power lifters, more sled work. Strong men, more body work, uh, body weight work, and bodybuilders. Um, well, just more, fu more functional conditioning. More functional conditioning, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think well, everybody should do more. But, you know. Got it. <laughs> uh, so, um, when it comes to mobility work, um, I know you're a big, uh, you, you, you love the animal crawls, and uh, is there anything else that you could add to that? Yeah, so, uh, I, I've always loved the sort of flow movements. Um, it may come from the fact that I was a dancer, so I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. We learned something new. But, <laughs> yeah. What kind of dance? But, um, I'm going to digress now. Mainly contemporary. Okay. Um, but I also did like ballet and yeah. like hip hop and break dancing. Oh, wow. <laughs> something new. Don't ask me to dance now, it's been a very long time. I had Occasionally, no idea. after a few drinks, I think well, I can still break dance, but okay. that's. Um, I'm gonna call you over that. Yeah. 
yeah. one day. It's a very rare occasion now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I have I've found like flows to be very beneficial. So if I was ever to do yoga, I liked like vinyasa flow, like versus some of the more static versions of yoga. But I don't think there's as much benefit to doing a lot of yoga for lifters because you only need so much mobility um, and the problem with a lot of the way well the way a lot of people practice yoga is that it's almost you're passive so it's like how can I push myself into a position and it's not active strength correct so I'm more inclined towards uh, so strong fit do their opener series which is working the end range of motion in certain movements but um like the functional range conditioning guys and that do all of that like um active work in end range of motion and i feel like that's a better addition to what we do in as, as a sport because like to be in the bottom of a squat, you can't be relaxed there. It has to be strength in that 100% position. Hundred percent, you'd be taken. Yeah. So, if you're getting someone to push themselves into a bottom of a squat, but it's not, um, they're not strong in that position. It's counterproductive. Huh. Um, so that is in, that is what I would suggest as far as mobility. And I, like I said, I'm not a fan of. Um, rolling if you're going to roll do it after your session um but to be honest i haven't rolled and in years so cool yeah all right so from what we gather it's a little bit of vinyasa a little bit of frc Mm -hmm. at the end Uh, a little bit of animal crawling Mm -hmm. and uh just go with the flow kettlebell stuff um, in what sense, like as like accessory it? work and as stuff? As accessory work, yeah. Yeah, I love like that sort of things. Yeah. yeah. Just Again, it's it. like active movement. Yeah. I love that stuff. Yeah. Cool. Um, what would be your top squat, bench, deadlift accessories? Like your top, top, top. Let's start with squat. Um, squat, uh, split squats or lunges. Okay. Um, I think we don't. And there's a difference, people. Yes, there is most definitely a difference. I personally am not a fan of a Bulgarian split squat, just because of my mobility. It hurts. <laughs> like for me to get into a Bulgarian split squat position, I get a hip, uh, a nerve impingement, impingement, and it is incredibly painful. So I can't do them. But if you can do them, they're great. Um, so if like someone I'm coaching is able to do it and not be in pain, then I definitely program them. But, Perfect. Um, you know, I remember a stat, I think Charles Polican was saying, it was like only 2% of the world can actually get into a proper Bulgarian squat position, and those 2% are dancers. <laughs> well, that's not surprising. Um, the, when you see like what real like ballerinas and stuff can get their body into. But a lot of times that's not... Um, strong positions either uh, yeah and it's not something that we we yeah. we need to so uh, be in. yeah if you can get into that position great if not um like a front foot elevated split squat um favorite thing more ever. than enough um and uh like lunges anything weighted i think most people don't do enough unilateral work so um as an accessory to squatting i think beautiful. more of it beautiful um Bench, Top bench. Um, sled rope pulls. Sled rope pulls. Um, so we're talking pulling. No, um, bent over horizontal. Okay. Um, like body horizontal to the floor. Yeah. Um, short pulls to the face, uh, to the from the face to the belly. Um, fast. It just really gets um, bicep, pec, uh, teres major, and. I find most people, those are like severely lacking. So it's a really fast way to get at that, um, build up imbalances, because again, it's unilateral. Um, and again, super low skill. So you can like get to fatigue really quickly. Um, 
get a great pump. <laughs> um, I obviously do lots of different row variations as well and like lap pull downs and all of that sort of stuff and then loads of different pressing variations but the rope pull was like a big one. Well, okay, that's something new that I learned too. Yeah. So face down, Yep. pull fast. Yeah, just make sure Short that pulls. you're not... Um, What's common is if those muscles, the correct muscles aren't built, is that people start to like shrug and go into yeah. traps. Okay. So just really concentrating on keeping it down and feeling it in the right places. Keep the neutral spine, all the wonderful Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, deadlift. Um, it depends on what type of deadlift you're doing. Um, if you're conventional sumo or, conventional. or sumo. But I am a big fan of the stiff leg deadlift um, I'm quite flexible so I have to do like quite a deficit to really get um, a good benefit from those but um, there's that's... a difference between SDL and RDL yes so you're talking about SDL yes straight straight like, well, or by a little bit of bend yeah okay um, so for me that's um, the main reason that is a big one for me is that I had um, the inside of my hamstrings was underdeveloped um, for a long time, so I've had to spend a long time building that up. So um, learning how to do a stiff leg deadlift properly and make sure that I'm getting the right hamstring engagement was like, and that helped me to build that up very well. So um, I also, this is a little bit like, most people that are powerlifters have never seen this. A few people questioned it when I was doing it last <laughs> week. But um, a, for me, um, to warm up, to get into a sumo position, I found that very hard for a long time just to get my hips into the right position. Okay. So I actually like a Jefferson squat. Uh. Um, so you've like got between the legs. this barbell between your legs and you're doing a squat into that so strong fit call it a hip opener um, and it's like an empty barbell but you're really focusing on like the right muscles working and the right foot, like full um, yep. proprioception in the foot and whatever else and that was the one thing that got me to actually be in the right sumo position Ooh. Um, and I like time. went like months of trying to get and work it out and then I started playing with that and straight away I was like oh now that's how it's supposed to feel um, so yeah if you've never done that and you struggle to get into a good sumo position that'll help with the hip position and starting to feel the right muscle engagement so cool what advice do you have for you know so since we're talking about sumo I know that many people get into sumo they find it more comfortable they like it, um, not be not because it's a shorter range of motion, but also because it's easier in the back. Yeah. And um, but they do find a lot of times adductor tightness, mm. adductor tightness. But what would be your top tip for that? Like, how would you how would you approach that when a client came to you and said, um, "I love the sumo position, but I do feel like my adductors are." Well, the Jefferson is amazing. The Jefferson. For that. That's yeah. It just really opens everything up. Um, I'd also be looking at like how often they're doing the lift. Like sometimes just being in that position too much isn't like our joints and our ligaments and our tendons, like especially as adults, are not prepared for like these crazy positions sometimes. And then we're putting them under load and asking them to fire re, re, yeah. like over many repetitions and then at some point something's going to go wrong it's like um, we talk about this sometimes with like children in gymnastics it's like their bodies adapt so quickly you can put them into crazy positions and they do like these shitloads of work and they're all and they're fine because their body is like everything's like growing at the same time but it, like as adults our muscles grow but the, the the other things are like not keeping Still up. Still taking time, yeah. So, you know, you've got to listen to that. If you're in pain, it's probably just going, oh, it's tight, I'll just stretch more, might not be the solution. You know, I heard something interesting yesterday. Um, it was from McGill. And I think Lane was talking to McGill and uh, he was saying, 
and generally when people find a tight side and uh, a loose side, so what they do is they try to loosen up the tight side. The correct approach is to strengthen, strengthen the loose the side because yeah. that's the weak side, right? So the, that's the whole thing. Like when someone comes to me with like a really blown up erector on one side, they're like, oh, I'm just keep trying to loosen that. And I'm like, no, well, that's the, that's your body saying that there's something else that's weak. So bring up the weakness and then the imbalance will improve. Perfect. So yeah, I love this. Very <laughs> nice. Alrighty. Um, anything you want to add to training? No. Last words? We're good? good? Okay, let's move into nutrition. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is, uh, I think, the big one these days. Let's talk about your everyday nutrition. Well, not the holiday nutrition, but, or not what we just ate, but. Well, it's, um, it's funny because um, nutrition is like a huge thing for a lot of people, and definitely dialing in my nutrition so that my body fat percentage was better. What did you compete at? Do you know? This last comp, I was at uh, set just over 70 kilos. Okay. Um, and it's the lightest I've ever competed. Wow. Um, the obviously I compete in the 72 kilo class, but I'm normally right on there, and a lot of times I'm sitting around 74, 75. Um, mm. So. And for a lot of people that don't know, you generally have a six pack year round. Uh, no. <laughs> as far as I've seen. Occasionally I look like I have a six pack if the lighting's good. Um, but generally, no. Um, I'm not that lean. When, it, when I'm looking that lean, I'm normally under 70. So um, sometimes, especially, sometimes I'll cut just because I like to like play with it. And um, I prefer to cut in off season when it's not around comp and then be at a point where I have weight I can gain and I can eat more while I'm prepping so yeah, um, yeah in off season sometimes dieting, right? I'll it's cut yeah so sometimes dieting. I'll cut down to like 68 um, and that's when I look like I have abs <laughs> okay she's too modest <laughs> yeah um, being white definitely doesn't help because I you look less ripped because there's like no shadows. You want my color? Take my color. <laughs> I love it. Um, but for me, a few years back, um, I realized when I was doing CrossFit that I needed to dial in my nutrition more um, to support the training. But also, I was. It was a few years ago, I had slightly less muscle mass. I was weighing about mm. 75 kilos, mm. and I was about. Must have been about 25% body fat. Yeah. And with CrossFit, it was you so much body weight work. Yeah. So it made it very challenging for me when we had to do like high volume handstand push ups and pull ups and things to compete with girls who were like 20 kilos lighter. Yeah. Um, so that's when I first started thinking about I need to start dialing in my nutrition. Uh, and so I actually went for a long time and followed um, RP strength, Renaissance periodization. Okay, yeah, yeah I've heard of them. Um, I don't recommend them for everyone because sometimes you have to, I think the first priority is um, are you eating enough protein, Is your, um, are you eating enough like meals, are you, eat, like, are you eating yeah, real food? Are you, are you eating enough for your sport? Um, so. But also is your gut functioning, like mm -hmm. are your hormones completely out of whack? If those things are not in place, if you're not sleeping and you're like, those things are more important than like, have I got the perfect macronutrients and meal timing? So, um, I yeah. would I look at those things first. Like, are you sleeping? Um, like, are you having regular bowel movements? Like, if you're a female, have you got your period? If those things are out of whack, then I would refer to someone who's a specialist. Yeah. Um, I had already a good base of knowledge about nutrition. Um, my gut was fine. I didn't have issues with my hormones. So then I could go on to like RP do a um, like nutrition templates. They do custom coaching and things like that. But for me, I didn't need the accountability of someone telling me every week, like, have you eaten enough? Um, so their templates literally have list of lean proteins, um, carbohydrates, green vegetables, healthy fats, Simple. and then it says, do you train in the morning, 
middle of the morning, afternoon, evening, and then it has your timings for all your meals and your macronutrients for every meal um, based on that. And so for me, doing that for about a year, like when I say a year, it was you do a 12 week cut and then you go back and you do 12 weeks of maintaining yeah. and getting your, nutri- your calories back up and then eventually do another cut. Um, but that taught me a lot about portion sizing, um, timing my macros around my training, increasing calories on certain training days, um, which meant now I'm in a position where I don't really have to measure things. Yeah. Um, I can be more intuitive because I, yeah. I've been doing it for a long time. So um, now it's more like, am I getting enough protein, protein servings? Uh, am I eating uh, enough generally? Yeah. Um, yeah. So. I think yeah. that, that that kind of brings like everything that you just said just brought like two things to mind. Um, number one is there's a lot of let's say, let's just say crossfitters, I'm, I'm more leaning towards um, eat for your sport. Mm. Um, a lot of crossfitters who um, are under eating. Yeah. There's a, they have a, they have a dietitian or a nutritionist and they are, they are severely under eating. Yeah. There's, um, there's one that particularly comes to mind, but there are, yeah, it's a, yeah. it's a problem. It's a problem. And um, I mean, when you look at the professionals, the top and top of their sport. Look at their nutrition. Mm-hmm. I think the big thing is the amount of carbs. Yeah. That these guys, their their carbs are close to 200, 300, 400 sometimes per day. Well, Whereas, you have to be for the amount of output you're you're exactly. doing. You need it to yeah. be able to recover for your body systems to complete yeah. continue yeah. functioning. Yeah. Um, so don't think you're going to do keto and try to be CrossFit. Like, maybe some people might be doing it again. Yeah. Just. Go to a professional. Definitely. Yeah. And it's not that, like, not every diet, every person's going to be different. Some diets exactly. will work for yeah. some people. And there will be um, some times in your life where something might be the right thing for you right now, but your body demands change as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. So then you have to be constantly aware of, like, how your body is responding to something. Yeah. So that you can also be responsive with change. Cool. Nice. Um, second thing is something to keep in mind. I think this you can add a little bit more. I'm not so much into CrossFit, but uh, the opposite side of the spectrum, where people think that you can do CrossFit and eat whatever the hell you want, yeah. and you know, you touched upon something where you said my body weight does matter. Yeah. So it's like, remember, yeah, CrossFit mm-hmm. does have a lot of gloves, does have a lot of burpees, does mm-hmm. have a lot of handstand push-ups and stuff. And the heavier you are, the tougher it gets. Yeah. Right. Well, so it's funny you mentioned that because when I first started, I was like, I'm training so I can eat anything. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, no. And I would, I would like it. it Everyone wants to be rich. Like, I still love cake and chocolate yeah. and those things, and but I eat them in moderation to fit mm-hmm. in my diet, and I make choices to make sure that they fit now. Yeah. Um, versus just eating whatever and then going, I'll just train harder. Um, it doesn't work. Um, like there is kind of an ideal body fat percentage that you kind of want to be at yeah. like you don't want to have more fat on your body than is necessary but you also don't want to be so lean that you like bodybuilders that are stage ready are not healthy um, so you know you want to avoid that as well because yeah. it comes with its own issues yeah. so there's balance and everything we uh <laughs> <laughs> I remember in Toronto when we first, like, this is when, like, 2011, 2012, when I first got, like, just level one CrossFit, and we used to, we used to follow Rich Froning at that time. Because re- what's Rich doing, Because right? uh, what's Rich doing, right? <laughs> um, and I remember watching, watching, a, it was like a podcast or a video, and he was like, oh yeah, now we got to get some McDonald's and blah, 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 and, like, and all of us, like, we were in a row, and we were like, yeah. We're gonna we're gonna train hard and we're gonna get McDonald's. <laughs> we started doing that every day and we're like, what the hell I don't is happening to us? Why I'm getting like, fat. how is Rich so lean? Anyways, yeah. Um, so yeah. And the thing is, like, they show something like that, but it's like they also don't show what he's eating the whole rest of the time. Oh, and the guy's and like, a machine. He's like training yeah. three times a day. Well, it's also like from what I've heard, he hardly eats anything most of the time. And then at the end of the day, he's like, oh fuck, I haven't eaten. 
So then he goes and has to eat. So it's like, well, you've got to get calories in somehow. Um, Goodness. Yeah, I think a few of the people who'd been on training at Mayhem in the last few years have commented. It's like when they arrived there, they were like, when do people eat? And they're like, "Uh, well, they don't really. So like, work out out your own thing around it. (laughs) So it's like... Holy you know, shit. most like that's not normal. People can't function like yeah, that. You can. So he is an outlier. Yeah, he is know? an outlier, and remember yeah. that. People <laughs> exactly. To, yeah. People, people do need to remember that. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay, um, intolerances. Uh, Are you? Uh, what do you have to say to that? So I'm talking about gluten. I'm talking about lactose. Well, some people have them. No. And it's if you have an intolerance, you've got to be aware of that and make the appropriate adjustments. Um, I know I am mildly um, intolerant to dairy, so I can get away with having some dairy, but if I go overboard, I get a really upset stomach, so I just limit it. Um, But I know other people that it's like they have any gluten and they like puff up and it's a huge issue, or if they have, yeah. So, you know, they exist, but I think sometimes people are like, well overboard like they'll go get their intolerance test and then they won't eat anything on the list and it's um, I'm intolerant to everything like you know well, that's there's, there's extremes stuff, yeah. as well yeah yeah okay um, supplements would you recommend what do you take so Ooh. I was asked this yesterday uh, and I laugh because I'm a terrible um, ambassador for supplements because I really don't take anything yeah um, I think if I'm sleeping well and I'm eating well, um, there are probably some things I could take, but the quality of supplements um, that is accessible to most people is kind of average. So, Correct. Um, it, I have found when I took stuff versus not taking stuff, it was no real difference. Okay. So. I'll sometimes drink BCAAs when I'm training, but it's more because of the flavor rather than I actually think it's doing anything. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I agree, and, and and the more I'm, the more I get into, I, I de- definitely agree with the fact that the quality is below, mm. is substandard. I like, think if you could get, if you have access stuff, to yeah. really good quality. Yeah. Um, Do you have any brands that come to mind? Um, I know that Thorn is. No, not as being a great one from the US, but um, yeah. ATP Labs, you're familiar with them? No. Okay, cool. Anyway, well, well, I'm sure there are a few great companies. Like, if anyone wants to sponsor me with a really great company supplement, and. (laughs) Right here, there's our little ad for herself. Um, One of the strongest women in the world, people. One day. <laughs> um, peaking. So, what is uh, peaking protocol? So you said that's 18 weeks. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you don't do much with your diet. If anything, you're you're below your weight, and then you eat up. Yeah, that's the goal. Yeah. I want to try and stay um, stay as close to the weight I want to be through comps through the whole thing. That's when's your last heavy day? So you say you were competing on Saturday, like my, two weeks from now. Yeah, my last heavy day was about like five days before. Okay. So you're, you're okay. So you so you like to lift like five. And then what happens the next five days? Um, I still lift um, for like two of those days. I um, just a little bit lighter, just keeping like technique. And it wasn't. It's not that much lighter. It's just. Um, the intensity is slightly less, a uh, few less sets, um, but we still kept like volume and intensity relatively high right through to the end. And then um, I still did like cardio, and then I try not to do anything just stupid that's going to hurt me. Like I made that mistake one of my first comps. I was like, oh, it's my like peaking. I like I'm deloading this week. I'll do gymnastics strength this week. And I was like, why are my hamstrings so sore? <laughs> like the day of, day of comp, tr- having to deadlift. And I'm like, oh, because I did that new thing. Because like, yeah. So don't do that. Um, like give yourself the rest. But um, for me, I found that keeping the volume and intensity relatively high right through um, was good. Good. Okay. And I think, 
uh, from what I learned from this is everyone's different. Yes. And it's so important to know yourself, mm -hmm. but you cannot know yourself if you don't try it. No, exactly. Um, that's one of the things uh, that I found interesting looking, um, learning more from like Mike Teixeira. He does like so much, um, like everything that he does with himself and his athletes is recorded. Um, and essentially, you're only going to know if you've done the thing and then recorded what the result was, and then you'll know if it worked out. So, um, what works for me would definitely not work for you. Correct, yeah. <laughs> but, but you couldn't know that without trying, right? So, Correct. well, <laughs> I could know that the volume would probably kill you, but... <laughs> yeah, well, enough, I but, am. No, but it's also like... And I'm Indian yeah, too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we are lazy. Like, like, no, so. But yeah. it's like, um, <laughs> you kind of, you start at a base of like, you could do any sort of general yeah. program and then you adapt based on mm -hmm. how the response is, mm -hmm. right? Um, rather than, oh, I'll try this and I'll try that. It's yeah. like, you'll only know from trying things. Correct. Correct. So be open. Mm. And uh, note down everything. Yeah. Because you, yeah. You will miss so many times what worked for you and what didn't work for you. Mm. But if it's in a notebook and you go through that maybe at the end of the month, you'll know exactly which day you felt good. You felt great. What food worked, what sleep worked, what timings worked, what all yeah. that kind of wonderful stuff. Yeah. There's many variables that. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is dreams and goals. So I left this a little open-ended, but what are Jesse's? dreams and goals well <laughs> as you know I'm in a very um, I guess a state of flux at the moment um, I have recently you know taken that plunge to not work in corporate and to um, do the things that I'm passionate about I am very um, uh, inspired by um, when I'm coaching and when I see uh, women start to overcome things that they never thought they could do before. Okay. So for me, empowering women in strength sports so that they do their first ever pull up when they thought it was impossible or um, they squat a weight they never imagined being able to squat. Those things to me, once you do something that was impossible, you start to realize that other things are no longer impossible. So um, encouraging women to get strong and uh, see themselves that way transforms the rest of their lives. Okay. So it's like the gateway to then um, having better career and better relationships and all yeah. of those things. And of course, um, mindfulness and um, other things in life are really important. But sometimes people need to just to get in the gym and start moving and see that some see that they can do things that they never thought they could do. And that takes them to the place where they're ready to deal with other things in their lives Beautiful. so that to me is what I want to spend my life doing um, so I'm in the process now of um, trying to create a platform to do that um, so it's going to be interesting over the next few years how that um, takes shape um, what country I will be in. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of things happening um, in the black background and that as I think as long as I'm driven by that purpose then I'll end up in the right place and where I'm supposed to be around the right people and all of those things. Um, on a personal level um, I would really love to um, represent my country at Worlds one day. Australia. Yes, um, but that is a long-term goal. There is lots of politics in the powerlifting world at the moment. Correct. So I'm not getting caught up in that. To me, as long as I'm training and I'm consistent and I'm getting stronger, and each time I compete, I get a better total, um, 
one day I'll end up there. So, t- yeah. like, I, I don't see there being a time frame on it because if I have to do it this year, then, you know, the, then there's this kind of sense of loss if you don't achieve it. Whereas um, if my goal is just to be better each time I turn up at the gym and each time I compete, then, like, that's something that I can continue doing. Um, and there's no, never a loss at it. Like, yeah. What would be your, so let's talk more specifics. Mm-hmm. What would be your ultimate squat goal? Dream. <laughs> Dream. <laughs> I want to be able to squat like Isabella. <laughs> How much is that again? Oh, over 200. Oh my God, I want her squat. Um, yeah, if I can, if I can squat up close to the 200s one day, that would be amazing. You're not far. Well, 50 kilos off it. <laughs> but like, yeah. You just when finally I, got serious into it now again. Yeah, when I started, when I made the change, like a year and a half ago or something, um, my squat was 125. So you know, making well, progress. There was a lot of fixing technique and stuff, but you no, know, long term. Yeah. Um, bench. I want my bench to be like well, a good, well over 100. So if I can get up to that, like 110, 115, I'll be a happy cappy. Um, and I'd like my deadlift to be up around the 200s as well, so or higher. But it's all gonna come Soon. eventually. Eventually, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, consistency. We're gonna stay tuned. There are some deadly numbers. Um, okay. Anything else you want to add to dreams? No, I think that's good. good. Yep. Okay. Um, Jesse knows Dubai and the best places to eat and the best places to get coffee. So we thought we'd include this uh, little segment, which we've had, but you know Dubai better than I do. So um, when in the when in the Middle East. What would be your favorite restaurant or recommended restaurant? Okay. For strength athletes. Uh, for strength athletes, well, that's a different answer. But uh-huh. if you have never been to, if you're in Dubai and you've never been to Bukater. Bukater. Yeah, it's so I, too, a little restaurant in like the fisherman's village in Jumeirah. And they literally just have fresh caught fish and you go in and like go I want fish and they literally just like deep fry this giant fish and it's fish and curry sauce and like naan bread and it's you go in there and like when we're there it's like this like a few times I've been and I've been the only white person Um, and you like eat with your hands they do like um, big plates of like um, chili prawns as well but it's literally like fish or prawns that's all you can get you can get rice. Bukater. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's like a Dubai institution and it's um, an experience that everyone has to have. It's, it's awesome. Um, they now are in a building, but for many years it was literally just like a porter cabin by the beach. And you would go and like choose the fish and sit on plastic chairs outside. So now it's a little bit fancier, but um, it's an experience that I think everyone should have. So. Okay, done. Um, what about strength athletes? Um, Where would you? I really like heat okay. um, for the value for money. Cheap I think sticks. it's yeah, it's re- I love it. It's it's well priced for what you're getting, and if you want to get like twelve eggs, they'll do it for you. So it's like if you're one of those people. Not that I've ever done that, <laughs> but um, they okay. do. Like if you want to go for breakfast, they do like. Um, eggs and pancakes and you can get like steak and all of that stuff um, and the coffee is good and yeah it's good I love heat too yeah mm. nice okay um, recommended coffee shop there are lots of good coffee shops in Dubai but um, here because we're in warehouse in Al uh I love Cafe Rider um, it's a close walk and the atmosphere is lovely and the food is, uh, the coffee is really good um, and the guys who run the place are lovely so yeah nice um, bu- 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 recommended takeout or order in whatever you like to call it mm, I 
don't do a lot of takeout, to be honest. Um, <laughs> um, normally, I would, if I'm getting takeout, it'll be like looking for um, some like Lebanese food, mm -hmm. or just I don't actually have like a go-to. Okay. Lebanese food isn't like grilled, like chicken, yeah, like, like healthy. I'll stuff. get like a mixed grill and stuff. Cool. some salad and perfect. Yeah. Um, best steak in town that you've had so far. Best. Steak. You can't say heat. Well, you know there was um, shoot, what's it called? Um, before the address burnt down. Mm -hmm. in um, Business Bay, there was a steakhouse in there that I had a really great steak in. Um, I think it was cut, cut. by Wolfgang Huck. Um, but the building burnt down, so I don't, it's been a long time, clearly, since I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to think when the, I had another really good steak. Yeah, no. Okay. So, nowhere. Um, who would be the top people you would say um, we should be following in the Middle East? Um, so, Patrick. Um, so, I would say they're Desert Barbell. Desert Barbell, um, Patrick, yeah. Yeah, they're um, starting to put out really good content. They're a new company, but they're... Um, putting out like with the posts and stuff they're making about uh, like technique stuff and those sorts of things I think are great um, my uh, I've got a few good friends that I think are amazing uh, Ross Gilmore um, is a PT who's doing um, a lot of like instructional videos on um, correct uh, technique for um, Everything, Everything. Um, you know, and it's like all of the machines and things that you've seen in the gym that probably don't know how to use and he's um, doing some really great stuff there, so yep. um, I like that. Um, my friend, strength, uh, his strength coach Eloy, yep. um, on Instagram, he um, is very into the like Poliquin sort of stuff. And other things but he does some really great rants on his um, insta stories about he does like a my his like thing of the day and he does these rants while he's in the sauna <laughs> um, but sometimes it'll be like th this topic of the day is supplementation or yeah. um, and so I think that's really good stuff. So Ross, Eloy, yeah. Patrick, um, Desert Barbell. I feel like there should be people outside of the this my like direct group of people. <laughs> I know. Huh? Anyone around the world we should follow? Liz and Yeah, um, Liz Craig Joanne is a, as well. We amazing. Be, Pardon? We should be following Joanne. Oh you've got to follow Joanne. Like yeah. tweak. Tweak. Tweak me. Tweak. If me. you want like uh, amazing sports G strings, um, my best friend has literally created the most incredible product and you should definitely follow her um, but um, around the world um, like Bryce Lewis is my coach and he is a exceptional coach and athlete but I love that most of the stuff that he shares like on Instagram is a lot of things now about sports psychology and other things um, and good quality stuff yeah He's, yes. Yeah, and the strength athlete guys are great. Um, obviously, like Eric Helms, yeah. uh, who is Bryce's coach, and he's um, obviously a very smart human. Um, I love watching uh, Isabella squat. So she is like my squat hero, and um, obviously, like because. I like to follow people that I would like to be able to move like, so I watch like, Perfect. 
um, like um, Jennifer Thompson is like one of the best benches in the yeah, world so right, I would watch right. her and then obviously um, so it's nice. I think it's important to follow people that inspire you for good reasons yeah. and not for and don't make you feel bad about yourself or like think Fair. you're not good enough or whatever else yeah. so yeah cool. awesome um, last but not least in conclusion what advice would you give your 20 year old self um, so just before I left Australia I was given a card by my father actually and it said you are capable of more than you imagine um, and it went on to say I think you will see yourself in the future and be amazed by what you achieve. Um, and I think that's, I still look at that card sometimes and I'm like, wow. Um, and I still think the same is true. I think at some point I'll look back at where I am right now and be amazed at where I've come to from there. Um, I think if you trust that you're moving in the right direction and you move with intention towards things that you are passionate about and you are good to people then the right opportunities come and then if you're open to those opportunities you'll end up in places you couldn't have imagined so awesome stuff jesse anything you would like to add before we wrap up thank you so much for having me well thank <laughs> you so much for coming on and uh, i know this was a long time coming but uh, it was a total total pleasure Thank, thank you. you for thank you for joining us, and uh, um, we hope to see great, great, great things from you in the future, and definitely on the world stage. <laughs> and Hopefully. definitely, um, your true potential is tremendous. We know that. Thank Next you. couple of years, guys, pay attention. Follow her on Insta. <laughs> yes, do follow me on Insta. Yeah. I need more followers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, Jesse, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, thanks for watching, guys. Stay strong and stay hungry.